Grace and peace, my brothers and sisters, grace and peace. My name is Brother Yehuda, and I would like to say grace and peace to my brothers in Born Again Israelites and Risen with Christ Ministry. My brother Karadazar and my brother Beloved. Grace and peace, my brothers, and grace and peace to all my brothers and sisters as in the gospel and love Jesus Christ and the Heavenly Father. Grace and peace. Now, today's topic is part six of the Sermon on the Mount. We're in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 21 through 26, in the Sermon on the Mount. I will read. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of, judge, of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar in their remembrance that thy brother has aught against thee leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift Agree with thy adversity quickly while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversity deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast in prison. Rarely I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the utmost part thee. Now that's in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 21 through 26. Now Christ having laid down these principles that Moses and the prophets were still to be their rulers, but that the scribes and Pharisees were to be no longer their rulers. Christ proceeds to expound the law in some particular instance and to vindicate it from the corrupt glosses which those commentators had put upon it. Christ adds not anything new, only limits and restrains some permissions which had been abused. And as to the precepts, such the, the brief strictness and spiritual nature of them, adding such explanatory statutes as made them more clear, intended much towards the perfecting of our obedience to them. Because, you know, how are we going to do it right if we don't know what we're doing? And we're getting taught by people that's not even doing it right themselves. So how are we going to, if it's going to spread that way, we'll never get it right. We'll always be displeasing to the Heavenly Father. So Christ came to rectify that, to make it clear. In these verses, Christ explains the law of the sixth commandment, which is thou shalt not kill. According to the true intent and full extent of it, here is the command itself laid down. We're going to go in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 12. Re re rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted thy the prophets which were before you. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 12. We have heard it and remembered it. Christ speaks to them who, know, who knows the law, who had Moses read to them in their synagogues every Sabbath, every Sabbath day. You have heard it it was said by them or rather as it is in the in the margin to them of the old time to your forefathers the jews thou shalt not kill the laws of god are not noble upstart laws but were delivered to them of old time they are ancient laws but of that nature as never to be outdated nor nor grow obsolete the moral laws agree with the laws of the law of nature and the internal rules and, and reason of good and evil. That is the rectitude of the eternal mind. Killing is here forbidden. Killing ourselves is forbidden. Killing any other is forbidden directly or indirectly or being any way accessory to it. The law of God, the law of life is a hedge of protection about our lives. It was one of the precepts of Noah. We're going to go in the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. That's in the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verse 5. 
Now God is saying that he will take vengeance for your blood. Now we're going to go into the book of Genesis chapter 9 verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, sh by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So he cares about you because you're in his image. So that's why he wants you to walk in his image and not kill each other because that's not godly. God takes care of that. He's the judge of that. Now that's in the book of Genesis chapter 9 verse 6. Not only by the magistrate, but often God raises up one murderer to kill another. Therefore, to kill man is to deface God's image. And so injury is not only done to man, but also to God. So what you do unto others, he's doing to the heavenly father. Whatever you do to, he said, whatever you do to the least of his people, that you do unto me. So whenever you kill somebody, you're killing, you're, you're doing it to God. So just remember that. The explanation of this command, which the Jews teaches, contended themselves with their com comments upon it was whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. This was all they had to say upon it, that willful murderers were liable to the sword of justice and casual ones to the judgment of the city of refuge. The courts of judgment sat in the gates of their principal cities. The judges ordinarily were in numbers 23. These tried con con condemned and executed murderers so that whosoever killed was in danger of their judgment. Now this gloss of, their upon, of theirs upon this commandment was fortly, for it announced that the law of the sixth commandment was only external and forbade no man than the acts of murder and lay to restrain upon the inward lust for which war and fightings come. It was indeed the fundamental error of the Jewish teachings. So in other words, when God says that not, that shall not kill, he was talking about inward. Don't even think about it. Don't even Think about it in your in your heart that you want to have, to have this thing happen to a person. You wish that person to, to, to die. You wish to, He don't want you to have it in your heart and be angry with your brothers for no fault. That's you and com committed spiritual murder. He's not meaning outwardly just plain old killing somebody. So we have to understand this is what Christ came on our mouth to to rectify because people was getting it confused. They get out. He says, thou shalt not kill. So, okay. So if a person kills somebody, we can kill them. No, you're just as wrong. For killing the person that killed somebody you're just as wrong as them so you know one is no is nothing rectifies no one is better than the other when you kill somebody so this is what christ came to rectify so when somebody kills somebody they'll be punished by the heavenly father leave it to god he vengeance that now that the law of the sixth commandment was only external and forbade no man than the act of murder and laid to restrain upon the inward lust for which wars and fightings come. This was indeed a fundamental error of the Jewish teachers that the divine law forbid only the sinful acts, not the sinful thought. They were disposed to rest in the letter of the law. And they never required, inquired into the spiritual meaning of it. Paul, while the Pharisees, did not until by the key of the 10th commandment, divine grace led him into the knowledge of the spiritual nature of all the rest. We're going to go in the book of Romans and, and get clarity on that. Understand what Paul was talking about. In the book of Romans chapter 7 verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I have not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law has said, thou shalt not covet it. That's in the book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 7. So what Paul is saying, he had not known sin, but by till God gave the laws to the people, now he understands what sin is. Because the law was the recognizing your, of your sin. That's why God gave the laws. He didn't give laws because it was, in, in, it was um, intertwined with sin. Is because to recognize your sin so you won't do that sin again so you know what not to do 
just so an objection what then are the law and the sin the same thing and do they agree together no he says sin is reproved and condemned by the law but because sin cannot abide to be reproved and was not in a manner felt until it was provoked and stirred up by the law it takes occasion by this to be more outrageous and yet by no fault of the law by the word lust in this place he does not mean evil lust themselves evil does not lust yourself but the fountain from which the lust comes from which is man for the heathen philosophers themselves condemn wicked lust though somewhat poorly but as far as for the fountain of lust they could not so much as determine it and yet it is the very seat of the natural and unclean spot of filth we're going to go in the book of romans chapter 7 verse 14 for we know that the law is spiritual but i am carnal sold under sin that's in the book of romans chapter 7 verse 14 now the law is the curse of this matter because it requires a heavenly purity but when men are born they are bond slaves of corruption which they willingly serve another mistake of theirs was that this law was merely political and municipal given for them and intended as a directory for their courts and no more as if they only were the people and the wisdom of the law must die with them the explanation which christ gave of this commandment and we are sure that according to his explanation of it we must be judged hereafter and therefore ought to be ruled now the commandment is exceedingly exceeding broad and not to be limited by the will of the flesh or the will of men christ tells them that rash anger is heart murder we're gonna go in the book of matthew chapter 5 verse 22 but i say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother rocker shall be in danger of the council but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire that's in the book of matthews chapter 25 verse 22 so christ is explaining so if you're angry for no cause you know some people lash out a person because they feel that they doing this and doing that whatever the case may be so they lash out and they get angry and they they start saying some foul things to the person that's the spiritual murder then when you call a person a fool or rocker when you just just trying to condemn a person that's you're in danger of the council that's in the book of matthews chapter 5 verse 22 because everything is spiritual it's inward we're not talking about christ the father is not talking about outward so christ is breaking down the way the laws really are he's not taking away and destroying the laws he letting the people get understanding of the laws that's why he says think not that i've come to destroy the prophets or the laws i came to fulfill them so now that everybody was running around here with the, the wrong idea of the laws now christ is coming to clarify them to make it clear to you what the laws really meant so this is what we have to hear by the, the sermon on the mount now christ speaks of the judgment of god and of the difference of sin and therefore applies his words to the form of civil judgments which were the use which was then used of that judgment which was ruled by three men who had the hearing and deciding of money matters and such other small case causes by that judgment which stood of 23 judges who had the hearing and deciding of weighty affairs as the matter of the whole tribe or of a high priest or of a false prophet whereas we read here hell it is in the next in the text itself Jenhina, which is one hebrew word made out of two and is as if to say as the valley of hinnom which is the hebrew called tapet it was a place where the israelites cruel, cruelly sacrificed their children to false gods whereupon it was taken from a place appointed to torment the reprobates in we're gonna go in the book of jeremiah chapter 7 verse 31 and they had built the high places of topet 
which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters into the fire, which I command them not, neither came it into my heart. That's in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 31. The Jews used their four kinds of punishment before their government, which taken away by Herod. Hanging, beheaded, stoning, and burning. It is burning that Christ meant, because burning was the greatest punishment. Therefore, by making mention of a judgment, a counsel, and a fire, he shows that some sins are worse than others. But, yet, they are all such that we must give account for them and will be punished for them if we don't repent from our sins. Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause breaks the sixth commandment. By our brother here, we are to understand any person and neighbor are our brothers and sisters, though ever so much our inferior as a child, a servant, for we are all made of one blood. Anger is a natural passion there are causes, cases, in which it is lawful and commendable, but it is then sinful. When we are angry without a cause, the word is without a, any good effect, without moderation, so that the anger is then sinful when it is without any just. Provocation given either for no cause or no good cause, or no great and pro proportionable cause. When we are angry at children or servants for that which could not be helped, which was only a piece of forgetfulness or mistake, that we ourselves might easily have been guilty, and for which we should not have been angry at ourselves when we are angry upon groundless surmises. Surmises meaning a thought or idea based on scanty evidence or for tribal affronts not worth speaking of when it is without any good end aimed aimed at merely to show our authority to gratify a brutish passion to let people know our resentment and excite ourselves to revenge then it is in vain it is to do hurt whereas if we are at any time angry it should be to awaken the offender to repentance and prevent his doing so again to clear ourselves we're going to go in the book of second corinthians chapter 7 verse 11 for behold this self-same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort what carefulness it wrought in you yea what clearing of yourself yea what indignation yea what fear yea what vehemence desires yea what zeal yea what revenge in all things yea have approved yourself to be clear in this matter we're going to go in the book of second corinthians i'm sorry <laughs> that was in the book of second corinthians chapter 7 verse 11 i'm sorry we're going to read that again for behold this self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort what carefulness it wrought in you yea what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desires, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge in all things, yea, have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. That's in the book of Second Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 11. And to, and to give warning to others when it exceeds due bounds. When we are hardy and headstrong in our anger, violent and passionate outrage, outrageous and bad, and when we seek the hurt of those we are displeased in. This is a breach of the sixth commandment, which is thou shalt not kill. For he that is angry, angry would kill if he could, and thirst. He has that taken the first step towards it. Cain's killing his brother began in anger. He is a murderer in the account of God who knows his heart where murder proceeds. We're going to go in the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 19. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, fornications, thieves, false witness, blasphemies. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 19. 
Now Christ tells them that giving dis disgraceful language to our brothers is tongue murder, calling him Raka and thou fool, when this is done with mildness and for a good end to convince others of their vanity and folly, it is not sinful. James says, O vain man, and Paul, thou fool, and Christ himself, O fools, and slow of heart. But when it proceeds from anger and malice within, it is the smoke of that fire, which is kindled from hell, and falls under the same character. Raka is a scornful word. It comes from pride. Thou empty fellow, it is the language of that which Solomon calls proud wrath. We're going to go in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, word, 21, verse 24. Proud and haughty scorners is his name, who dealt in proud wrath. That's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 21, verse 24. Which tramples upon our brother disdain to set him even with the dogs of our flock. This people who knoweth not the law is cursed, so such language. We're going to go in the book of John, chapter 7, verse 49. But this, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. That's in the book of John, chapter 7, verse 49. Thou fools is a spiteful word. It comes from hatred, looking upon him, not only as mean and not to be honored, but as vile and not to be loved. Thou wicked man, thou reprobate. The former speaks of man without sense. This in scripture language speaks a man without grace the more the re reproach touches his spiritual condition the worse it is the former is haughty taunty of our brother this is a malicious censoring and condemning of him as abandoning of god now this is breach of the sixth commandment malicious slander and censors are poison under the tongue that kills secretly and slowly bitter words are, are as arrows that would suddenly. We're going to go in the book of Psalm, chapter 64, verse 3. Who wept their tongues like a sword and bent their bows to shoot, their bow, I'm sorry, bent their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. Meaning false reports and slanderous words towards one another or as a sword in the bones the good name of our neighbors which is better than life is thereby stabbed and murdered and it is an evidence of such an ill will to our neighbor as would strike at his life it is where in our power if it were in our power now he tells them christ tells them how light soever they made of this sin they will certainly be reckoned for he that is angry with his brother with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment of and anger of god he that calls him raka shall be in danger of the council of being punished by the sanhedrin for re reviving an Israelite, but whosoever say thou fool, thou profane person, thou child of hell, of hell, shall be in danger of hell fire. To which he condemns his brother. Some think it allusion to penal to the penalties used in the several courts of judgment among the Jews. Christ shows that the sins of rash anger expose men to lower or higher punishments according to the degrees of its proceeding. The Jews had three capital punishments, each worse than the other. Beheading, which was inflicted by the judgment, stoning by the council or chief, Sanhedrin, and burning in the valley of the son of Hinnom, which was used only to extraordinary cases. It signifies, therefore, that rash anger and reproachful language are damning sins, but some are more sinful than others and according accordingly there is a greater damnation and a sore punishment reserved for them christ will show which sin was most sinful by showing which it was the punishment therefore was most dreadful 
from all this, it is here in fear that we ought carefully to preserve the gospel love and peace with our brethren, and that if at any time a breach happens, we should labor for a reconciliation by confessing our faults, humbling ourselves to our brother, begging his pardon and making restitution or offering satisfaction for wrong done in word or deed, according as the nature of the thing is and that we should do this quickly for two reasons because until this be done we are utterly unfit for communion with God in holy ordinances we're going to go on the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 23 therefore if thou bring thy gift to the to the altar and there rem rememberest that thou brother has ought against thee that's in the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 23 so in other words God is saying when you when therefore thou bring thy gift to the altar like in other words you want to go give praise to, to God and you got to call with your brothers and sisters and you ain't rectify that but you want to give praise and you want to give honor to God and you want to give gifts like, of love to him and you have beef with your, your brothers and sister you got to rectify that first before you come to him with praise this is what God is saying the covenant's Pharisees taught that God was appeased by the sacrifices appointed in the law, which they themselves devoured. But Christ, on the contrary side, denies that God accepts any man's offering unless he makes satisfaction to his brother, who he has offended, and say, moreover, that these stubborn and stiff-necked despisers of their brethren will never escape the wrath and curse of God before they have made full satisfaction to their brethren. Christ applies all this all this speech to the state of his time, when there was then an altar standing in Jerusalem, and therefore they are very foolish that gather from this that we must build altar and use sacrifice. That's why <laughs> that's done away with. No altars and no sacrifice. But they are bigger fools who consider this to be purgatory which is spoken of as peace making and atonement one with another we're gonna go in the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 24 leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift that's in the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 24 the case supposed is that they that thy brother have somewhat against thee that thou has injured and offended him, either really or in his apprehension. If thou art the party offender, there needs not this delay. If thou have aught against thy brother, make short work. Of it no more is it to be done but to forgive him. We're going to go in the book of Mark, chapter 11, verse 25. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses so if you don't forgive him, god is not going to forgive you that's in the book of mark chapter 11 verse 25 when you will appear before the altar and forgive the injury but if any quarrel began on that side and the fault was either at first or afterwards dying so that thy brother has a controversy with thee go and be reconciled to him before thou offer thy gift at the altar before thou approach Solomon to God in the gospel service of prayer and praise hearing the word of the sacraments when we are addressing ourselves to the gospel exercise it is good for us to take that occasion of serious affection and self examination there are many things to be remembered when we bring our gifts to the altar and this among the rest, whether our brother has ought against us, then, if ever, we are disposed to be serious and therefore should then call ourselves to an account. The gospel exercises are not acceptable to God if they are per performed when we are in wrath, envy, malice, or uncharitableness or sins so displeasing to God that nothing pleases him which comes from a heart within they are predominant 
We're going to go in the book of First Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. I will therefore that I I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's in the book of First Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. He has spoken to the person who whom we must pray. And now he teaches that the difference of places is taken away. For in times past, only one nation and in one certain place came together to public service. But now churches of congregations are gathered together everywhere, orderly and decently. And men come together to serve God publicly with common prayer. Neither must we strive for the nation or for the purification of the body or for the place but for the mind to have it clear from all offense and full of sure trust and confidence so don't he say don't come up there with dirty sandals on you make sure you rectify anything you have with anybody else before you come and want to get praise you want to sing homes you want to get prayer you rectify you squared away with your brothers and sisters first then you come to the altar and he's not saying build an altar in your house. He's saying the altar is Christ. When you're coming to him spiritually, through your mind and your heart, sincerely, now you have a communion with him. It's not literally, it's spiritually. Now he talks to the sign of the times itself, the lifting up the hands of the calling upon God without the grief and offense of the mind, which hinders us from calling upon God with a good conscience. Doubting which is against faith. We're going to go in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 6. For let him ask in faith, nothing weary. For he that weary is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Prayer made in wrath are written in gall. That's in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 6. Now we're going to go in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 15. And when ye speak, forth your hand. And when, and when ye spread, forth your hand. I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. That's in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 15. Now he shows that where men are given to evil, deceit, cruelty, and extortion, extortion which is meant by blood, there God will show his anger and not accept them, though they seem holy as in the book of Isaiah. Chapter, we're going to go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 3. For your hands are defiled with a blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongues have uttered perseverances. Now we're going to go in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 15. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes, for ye have for, from you. Yea. When ye, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. That's in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 15. Now, we're going to go in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verse 4. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day. To make your voice to be a heard on high. That's in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verse 4. So in other words, a lot of people go through, they, they, they fast for strife and debate with others and smite with the fist of wickedness. Then want to go and fast and say, I'm fasting for the Lord. I'm going, I'm going to give praise. I'm going to, to give homes. I'm going to, I'm going to pray. And never rectifying the situation that they did. And come to repentance and reconciling that differences of the wickedness that they have done, either or, whether it was it was right or wrong, but whatever misunderstanding, rectify it with your brother or sister, so this way you come clean to the altar of God. Now that's in the book of Isaiah, chapter fifty-eight, verse four, meaning as long as you use contention or com oppression, your fasting and prayers will not be heard. Love or charity is so much better than all burnt offerings. So in other words, a lot of the, the, the burnt offerings was just an example. So God is saying, he said, love and charity is so much better than all burnt offerings. It's better than you say, person say, paying tithes. The love and charity 
is what the ties are that we owe to the Heavenly Father. We owe each, we owe it to the Father to be loving to one another. Now we're putting God first because we're doing the will of God. Because where he is, we are in his image, so he wants us to represent himself like him, not the way we've been running around here in darkness and stiff necked and rebellious. That God will have reconciliation made with an offended brother before the gift be offered. He is content to stay to stay for the gift rather than have it offered while we are under guilt and engaged in the quarrel. Though we are unfitted for communion with God, but a continual quarrel with a brother, yet that can be no excuse for the omission of the neglect of our duty. Leave there thy gift before the altar. Let ourself, let, let, lest otherwise, when thou hast gone away, thou be tempt, tempted not to come again. Many give this as a reason why they do not come to church or to communion because they are at variance with some neighbors and whose fault is that. So in other words, a lot of people say, well, I'm not even going to be bothered with going to church because, you know, I don't like this person. I don't like that person. So, you know, they can't have communion with God. And it's not communion when you go up to the altar when the God give you the bread, you're breaking bread. Now you have no communion is within your heart having a love and having clear conscience when you come to the altar of Christ. Christ is the altar. When you come to Christ, having a clear conscience, so now you're making amends with your brothers and sisters, now you're having loving communion with the Heavenly Father through Christ. This is what the communion is, the communication with God. Now he can't communicate with you if you have dirt on your soul, if you have wickedness or malice within your heart. He can't communicate with you. He wants to communicate with you. That's why he wants you to come in in love and in charity. So this is why he says, clear that up first and then come to him. Then he will reconcile you from your differences. Now, one sin will never excuse another, but will rather double the guilt. Want of charity cannot justify the want of pity. The difficulty is easy easily over those who have wronged us we must forgive and those whom we have wronged we must make satisfaction to or at least make a tender of it and desire a renewal of the friendship so that if reconciliation be not made it may not be our fault and then come and then come and come and welcome come and offer thy gift and it shall be accepted Therefore, we must not let the sun go down upon the wrath any day because we must go to prayer be before we go to sleep. Must less let the sun rise upon our wrath because until this be done, we lie exposed to much danger. So in other words, there's no excuse saying, well, I'm not going to pray tonight because I'm still angry with such and such. So now you're putting that, now you're putting the wrath upon your own self. Because you got to rectify it because you never know when the time is up, when Christ is coming back. And you want to have that. You want to, Christ said, you gotta, when he comes, he want everybody to be at peace. No quarrel with nobody, with brothers and sisters. So we have to be rectified. That got to be rectified and reconciled with each other. So this way we can be at peace when Christ comes back. If you love Christ, if you love the Heavenly Father, and if you like salvation, eternal life. If you want to be in the presence of the Heavenly Father forever, this is the duty that we have to go by. Not the way we think. Not be justifying our own actions. It's not about that. We have to do what Christ did on the sermon. What he taught. We have to listen to that. Hear ye him. The father said. This is what we have to do. This is we are ordained. This is the command. We have to be obedient to that. This is what God has rules. He has a way of doing things. He is holy. He said be unholy because I am holy. So he wants you to be holy because he is holy. And when he made you in his image. So he wants you to be holy as well. So it's no justification. He don't want you making excuses for whatever you're doing if it's in malice and wickedness. Now we're going to go in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 25. Agree with the adversity quickly while thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversity deliver thee to the judge and the judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast into prison. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 25. Remove, in other words, remove all causes 
from enmity. That hostility, remove it. Bring it out of you. We all know that everybody get angry, they go through stuff, they have misunderstandings. Okay, but rectify it. That's what it's saying. Don't let it keep going on. People, I know people be angry for years and don't, don't, don't rectify it. That's not the way. That's not godly. But then when this come to God with dirty sandals on, that's why he told Moses take those sandals off when he came to the holy ground. You can't come there with them. With, with he had killed the, the Egyptian. He had holy dirty sandals. Those are the sandals he wore. Take those sandals. Remove those sandals from our feet. We're on holy grounds. So we can't go there with dirty sandals on. We have to come clean and rectify that. Now we're going to go into the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 26. Rarely I say unto you, thou shalt be no means come out thence till thou hast paid the utmost farthing. That's in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 26. You will be dealt with in this matter to the utmost extern extremely. It is at our peril if we do not labor after an agreement and that quickly upon the two accounts. Upon a temporal account, if the offense we have done to our brother and his body, goods, or reputation be such as will bear action in which he may recover cons considerable da damage. It is our wisdom and it is our duty to our family to prevent that by a humble submission and a just and peaceable satisfaction, lest otherwise he recovers it by law and put us to the extre extremity of a prison. In such a case, it is better to compound and make the best terms we can than to stand it out, for it is in vain to contend with the law, and there is danger of our being crushed by it. Many ruin their estate by an obstinate persisting in the offenses they have given, which would soon have been pacified by a little yielding at first. Solemn's advice in case of suretyship is go humble thyself and so secure and deliver thyself. We're going to go in the book of Proverbs chapter 6 verse 1 through 5. My son, if thou be surely for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hands of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thy eyes, nor slumber to thy eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. That's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 1 through 5. It is good to agree, for the law is costly, though we must be merciful to those we have advantage against. We must, yet we must be just to those that we that we have advantage against against us. As far as we are able, agree and compound with thy adversity quickly, lest he be exasperated by thy stubbornness and provoked to insist upon the utmost demand and will not make thee the abatement which at first he would have made and a prison is an uncomfortable place to those who are brought to it by their own pride and wastefulness their own willfulness of folly upon a spiritual account go and be reconciled to thy to thy brother be just to him, be friendly with him, because while the quarrel continues, as thou art unfit to bring thy gift to the altar, unfit to come to the table of the Lord, so thou art unfit to die. If thou persist in this sin, there is danger lest thou be suddenly snatched away by the wrath of God, whose judgment thou can not escape nor accept against if that iniquity be laid to the charge, thou art undone forever. Hell is a prison for all that live and die in malice and uncharitableness, for all that are continuous, contentious. We're going to go in the book of Romans, chapter 2, verse 8. But, when, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. That's in the book of Romans, chapter 2, verse 8. By truth, he means the knowledge which we naturally have. 
God's indignation against sinners which will quickly be kindled and out of the prison there is no rescue there is no rescue re redemption no escape to eternity this is very ac acceptable to the great business of our reconciliation to God through Christ agree with him quickly while thou art in the way the great God is in adversity to all sinners a law adversity he has a con controversy with them an action against them it is our concern to agree with them to acquit ourselves with them that we may be at peace we're going to go in the book of Job chapter 22 verse 21 Job chapter 22 verse 21 acquainted now thyself with him be at peace thereby good shall come unto thee that's in the book of Job chapter 22 verse 21 now he exalts Job to repentance and to return to God we're gonna go in the book of 2nd Corinthians chapter 5, 5 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 now then we are ambassadors of for Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God that's in the book of 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 it is our wisdom to do this quickly while we are in the way while we are alive we are in the way after death it will be too late to do it therefore give not sleep to thy eyes until it be done they who continue in the state of enmity to God are continually exposed to the arrest of his justice and the most dreadful instance of his wrath Christ is the judge to whom in penance sinners will be delivered for all judgment is commended committed to the son he that was rejected as a savior cannot be escaped as a judge we're gonna go in the book of revelations chapter 6 verse 16 and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from revelation 6 verse 16 and he and said to the mountain of rocks of and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb that's in the book of revelations chapter 6 verse 16. these are words of those who despise to despair of escape of the cause of this despair there are two arguments the presence of god and the lamb provoked to wrath against the world in this verse and the, the awareness of their own wickedness feeling that they are not able to survive the day of the wrath of god we're going to go in the book of revelations chapter 6 verse 17 for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand and it is said in the book of Isaiah chapter um, that was book of Revelation chapter 6 verse 17 and it is also said in the book of Isaiah chapter 14 verse 27 for the Lord of hosts has purpose for who shall denial it disannul it disannul it and his hand is stretched out and who shall turn it back it is fearful thing to be turned over to the Lord Jesus when the lamb shall become the lion angels are the officers to whom Christ will deliver them that's in the book of Isaiah chapter 14 verse 27 now we're gonna go in the book of Matthews chapter 13 verse 41 and 42 the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gashing of teeth that's in the book of matthew chapter 13 verse 41 and 42. devils are two devils are so too having the power of death as executioners to all unbelievers we're going to go in the book of hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. for as much then as the children are are partakers of the flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the, the devil that's in the book of hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 
that are made of flesh and blood, which is a frail and delicate nature. The devil is said to have the power of death because he is the author of sin. And from sin comes death. And because of this, he daily urges us to sin. He speaks of him as a prince, placing over all his angels. Hell is the prison into which those will be cast that continue in the state of enmity to God. So in other words, if you have hostility with your brothers and sisters, you have hostility with God. Let's all remember that. Just because you have hostility with your brothers and sisters doesn't mean that you're still in good standards with God. You have to rectify that with your brothers and sisters in order you can be clear with God and have good communion with God. So that's very important to remember. We're going to go on the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That's in the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. So the Greek calls the deep dungeons under the earth, which should be appointed to torment the souls of the wicked. Bound them with darkness as the chain, and by darkness he means that most miserable state of life that is full of harbor. Damned sins must remain in it to eternity. They shall be not depart until they have paid the utmost farthing, and that will not be to the utmost ages of eternity. Divine justice will be forever in the satisfying, but never satisfied. Now, that concludes this sixth part of the segment, the Sermon on the Mount. We will continue tomorrow with part seven of the Sermon on the Mount. In Christ Jesus' name, may God be the glory. As I walk, live, and pray in your image and likeness, the fruit of the Spirit. I come in love and leave in peace. Grace and peace and much love and blessings to you and your family. Have a blessed day to all the saints, my brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus. Amen.